Bibles and open up the book to Hebrews. Open up to the book of Hebrews, chapter number four. We'll read our verse for this series, this specific series right now that we're going through on prayer. Hebrews chapter four and verse number 16. As we've uh, looked at the word throne, we'll continue on in our looking at the word of grace as we just started to last time. We looked at one of the first things about it. We'll do some review on that. But Hebrews chapter number 4 and in verse number 16, the Bible says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's pray. Dear Father, I pray that you challenge us. I pray that you'll speak through me. Father, don't, don't allow me to, to use my words or my understanding or what I think needs to be done. Father, help me just to yield to you. Father, allow your spirit to speak through me. Allow it to be a changing, powerful truth from you. Allow me to get out of the way so you could have your will and way and, and move in whatever way you deem fit or deem necessary. And Father, help our hearts to be tender to the moving of the Holy Spirit so we can grow in you and therefore can please and honor you and glorify you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much. You may be seated. Thank you. you. may be seated. So we see here in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4 and verse number 16, once again, uh, we, we've been in this uh, verse for a few weeks now, but we see here it says, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace. And the first time uh, we started in this, we were looking at the word throne and, and the, the, the things that we can learn, the truths we can learn about prayer from understanding that we go before a throne. That we go before God's throne and the things that we can learn from that and the values that we can take in our prayer lives and we can go before this throne and the things that we should learn because of it. There are so many challenging things that we should have. So just a few of them is the enlarged expectations. I go before a king. My expectations should be that of a king, not of a measly man, not of a mortal man who is limited. This is the king of kings, the lord of lords, who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I should have enlarged expectations. I should have lowly reverence because he is the king. He is the king of kings. He is the lord of lords. And therefore my reverence should be just as such do him. It is his throne that I go before. So therefore... I come with boldness, but I come with lowly, humble reverence because he is the king, and I treat him as such. Just a few of the things that we learn from our word throne. Last time we were here, we finished up with throne, and we began looking at the word grace. You see, at first we're in awe of the glow and the brilliance and the splendor of the throne, but then the Bible comes with throne of grace. You see, no matter how magnificent and beautiful the throne is, it's just that. It's splendor, it's amazing, it's all. But God says it's the throne of grace. And it has this soft, beckoning call. Like Jesus Christ saying, come unto me. All you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's like Jesus Christ when he said to his disciples when they were uh, shooing the children away, Jesus Christ said, no, suffer. Beg the little ones to come unto me. That's the thought I get when I think of this word grace. It's the soft beckoning of the Savior of, I, I know it's a magnificent throne. I, I know it's my place of high majesty, says the Lord, but he says it's my place of grace. It's the place that I have deemed for grace. We've been called to the throne of grace. Not the throne of law, not even the throne of justice. It's God's throne of grace. We looked at first thing that we can learn from grace is faults overlooked. You see, it's the throne of grace. So when I go before this throne, my faults are overlooked by the gaze of grace. Because once again, when God looks at us, 
If we go in Jesus' name, we, we bear his son, and we are a Christian because we've accepted his free gift, God says, I overlook who you are, and I see my son. I see the blood of my precious son, and Jesus Christ himself said when he was on this earth, if you ask in my name, he, he will not. He will not reject you. He can't reject you when he sees me, when he sees my name, when you come in my name. God will not reject you. It's a place of grace. My personal faults, my shortcomings in prayer are overlooked by the gaze of grace. Grace overlooks the faults of the lowly. You see, if you feel that when you have prayed, it was a pitiful prayer. If we had uh, equated to, the, as I said last time, if we equated to the written note, it's blurred, it's smudged, it's just a travesty of a note. God says, my grace overlooks that. Whereas the throne of man, the kings of this earth, if we had a plea like that in front of them, you'd be thrown out for such a, a disgraceful plea to the almighty king. Get out of here, what are you doing? You're causing filth to come into this place with this pitiful plea that you bring. But God says, I overlook that. And I see the one that I love. And I see the one that I care for. It is grace which you stand before. And it's grace to help, as it says in the verse. And find grace to help in time of need. That's why God beckons us so softly and so tenderly to the throne. It's the throne of grace. You see, we ought not to search for the best prayer to the Lord, but the right and truthful prayer to God. Because once again, God's not impressed by mankind. God, the Bible says God is no respecter of persons. And in the book of Psalms, the Bible says God does not whistle out of man's legs, meaning God's not impressed with everything you can do. God says, I'd rather you be truthful and honest to me, even if though it may be pitiful, even though you might not be able to put it all together, even though it might be uh, uh, turned away by the thrones of men, even though it might be kicked out in the courtrooms of mankind. He says, I want you to be that way with me. I want you to show me who you are, and my grace will help in time of need. It's the throne of grace. You have at your aid the right to the right of the Holy Spirit as your interpreter and the Son as your intercessor. Remember that. The Holy Spirit who lives inside of you, he is the interpreter. He is the one that goes to, uh, on behalf of the Father. And when I have no words to say, I, I don't even know. I, I can't even put words together to understand what I'm trying and I need. The Holy Spirit goes to the Father and says, Amen. this is what he's trying to say. Yes. And you have the, 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 uh, the Son, Jesus Christ, sitting on the right hand of God. And it says so in the book of Hebrews that he ever liveth and intercesseth for you and for me. That's, that's what he does now. Amen. At all times, Jesus Christ sits on the right hand of the Father and he's praying for you all the time yeah. to the Father. Yeah. Can you imagine that? Oh, and once again, God cannot refuse his son. He says, how can I refuse you? He can't, and he won't, and he never will. Oh, what a joyous truth that my faults are overlooked by the gaze of grace. As long as I go with the Holy Spirit as my guide and the Son's name and blood as my goal, God will not reject and overlook your prayers. And no matter of an utter failure your request may be to mankind. What is that? You, you couldn't even stutter out the words properly. You couldn't even put the things together. I, I could barely understand what you're saying. I think of Hannah when she prayed to the Lord. Uh, uh, Eli thought she was drunk because she was praying and crying and her mouth was moving, but no sound was coming out. See, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. He says, in a man's way, he looks at that and says, get out of here. He tried to shoo her away. You see, that's what man sees. That's what the best you could get from man. But God says, I know what you're saying. My grace is sufficient for you. I, I, I know what you're saying, and I overlook our downfalls. I overlook our pitfalls and prayers. See, God beckons us, and he himself helps in the overcoming of our downfalls in prayer. Pray. Pray, Christian, pray. Never tire in prayer. You see, because we are sustained in grace. It helps our faults and prayers, 
but our faults as the petitioner themselves. As me, as an individual, as a sinful man, God says, my grace is still for you. My grace is never ending. You see, anyone that would not pray has no excuse and no reason not to pray. It is grace where our faults are overlooked. There is no earthly reason why mankind should not pray. Why every man should not pray, because it's the place of grace. There is no excuse. There is no reason why man should say, I cannot pray. Come back, come boldly, and come often to the throne, the throne of grace. That's the first thing, faults are overlooked. Secondly, desires are interpreted. We've already talked about this, but let's go more in detail. Not only are our faults overlooked, but our very desires, our thoughts are interpreted. If words cannot be found to utter the request, that's so great and so important, I I cannot find the words. I am in such derision. I am in such hurt. I cannot put the words together. God, in his unmatchable grace, will read the desire and interpret the prayer where no words have been found or said. He takes the meaning He finds the truth in the groanings. You see, the throne without grace would not trouble nor entangle itself with such pitiful existence and pitiful bringings forth of prayers. It would shoo them away. It would not take time for the trifle of making out the petitions of the unintelligible cries and groanings and the blabberings of the penitent soul and the one that's searching for the power of God. And often that's the best we can offer. You see, in man's eyes, those would be the worst and the ones we'd stay furthest away from. But oftentimes in God's economy, those are the ones where God says, oh, that's what I'm looking for. God could care less for the one that comes all uh, uh, ready to do and uh, to do and has all the special fancy words. Once again, God's not impressed. He wants to know the truth. Is this who you really are? Is this the true man, of the, the, as the Bible says, the hidden man of the heart? Or is this just who you want God to think you are? So once again, you know, we love the saying, God, uh, man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. Understand how damning that statement is. Yes, yeah, God looks on the heart. So no matter how much you try and put on and play up for God in your prayer life and in who you are as a Christian, God's not, God's not fooled. Right. God will never be fooled. No matter what you can do, you can fool me, you can fool your family, you can fool everyone in the world, but you'll never fool God. God will always know and see to the heart of the matter and see who you truly are. And until you get to that place of being who you truly are on your knees and before the Lord, you're missing out on the purity of prayer and having your desires interpreted. The throne of grace takes great pleasure in helping our feeble pleas. God God enjoys listening to the pleas that are true and honest. Oh, they may be pitiful existence in our realm of high and mighty individuals, but God takes great joy in interpreting them and saying, ooh, I like that one. Then the infinitely gracious one dives deep into the passion and the desire of those that need interpreting. You can't even find the words, let me help you. He will read what tongue can never speak nor understand. It's very much like parents with children. And the child is hurt, and they need something, and they just can't think of the word. They're crying, and they're begging for it, but they they don't even know what they need. They know they need something, but the parent knows what they need. The parent understands, and they say, this is what you need. Let me help you. I think it's the same way God is with us. I I don't even know what I need. My, My life is falling apart. I can't even put it together. I can't even find the words. And God says, I know what you need. Let me help you. You've come to the right place. You see, if a child doesn't know what they need and they have the unintelligible moanings, if they go to one of their siblings that's of the same level as they are, guess what? They're not going to get anything because they're not going to know either. Mm -hmm. You see, they need to go to someone that has the ability to help. And dear, dear friend, dear Christian, the only one that can truly help 
is the Lord because he's the one that interprets. He's the one that takes the, the poor child that's crying and groaning and in need of help and says, I know what you need. Just as the father says, yes, I know what you need. Amen. You need this. Let me give it to you. Let me help you as tender as ever. They will help the young hurting one find the word to say, is this what you needed? Is this what you're trying to say? Or they'll just fulfill the request knowing that they are in great need. That's our God. That's our Father. In the similar manner and love, the Spirit helps interpret and helps guide us and teach us the words in which we so desperately need. He will help write it upon our hearts and teach us and help us grow even especially in our trouble and our sorrow that's when we're most fertile and ready to grow is in the heartaches and troubling times of life God says if you're willing to allow me let me help you in these times how, how foolish would it be for the child that's in pain, that's hurting, that needs something from mom or needs something from their, from their loving father and they're not willing to go to them they're not willing to accept what they need. That's foolish. That's ridiculousness. You're in great need. You're in pain. You need something. I have it here. Here. No, I don't want it. But that's what we do. Anytime we're in great need and we don't go to the Father, we're not willing to humble ourselves and be honest with God, saying, I, I don't even know. God says, I have it. Just come to me. But that's, once again, that's admitting I have no safety, I have no security. Because if I don't know, right. I, I feel so vulnerable. And God says, I know. Find your safety in me. Find your fortress in me. But that takes us someone that trusts the Lord. Yeah. Because they're willing to say, I don't even know what I need. So I'm going to trust this is what it is. Once again, the child, they'll take what you give them. You're their parent. Oh, they're crying. They're in need. If you give them something that they don't need, they'll trust you. And they'll take it and they'll try and use it. Because they're willing to trust what you give them. That's what God's looking for. That's why he said, if you have faith of the, of the little ones, that's what God's looking for. Those that would trust him, no matter what. <laughs> it's from God, it has to be good. Just as a child, it's from mom and dad, it has to be what I need. It has to be what's important. You see, God understands what we need, and he's just, he's the one that's waiting for us. He's the one that already knows what we need, even before we go in prayer. He already knows. He will suggest and give what is good. He will guide to his promises in the Bible so I can plead them. As we learned about Job, fill my mouth with arguments. I need to know these things and God will oftentimes guide us to those things of, wow, God said he'll do that. God said he'll take care of me. God said he's nigh unto them of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. God said this and he is so good and blessed in the things that he does. I was talking with my wife, and uh, she's reading a book by uh, Mrs. Wilkerson. And in there she tells a story about the Lord doing something that he did not need to do. But she was having a hard time. She was very sad. And the Lord did something that he did not need to do. But out of the goodness of the Lord's heart, he just showed his love and grace and said, Amen. here's this. People have your God loves me signs and things like that. Those are good. And uh, it was after the time that her eldest son, Tyler, had died. I think it was about nine months to a year after it. And she was very hurting. And she asked the Lord, I just want to see Tyler again. And she knew she wasn't going to be able to see him, but she's a hurting mom. And uh, Pastor Wilkerson's very big about picking up litter and trash. Very big on it. Just, if it's on the ground, just pick it up. Throw it away. Not that big of a deal. Just whoop, throw it away. Amen. And she was walking out to her car. And there was a piece of trash on the ground. 
And she wasn't going to pick it up, but she knew she needed to. Linda, pick it up. Okay, I'll pick it up. And she picked it up. And she was going to go throw it away. And then it's like someone said to her, open it up. And she opened it up. And there was a yearbook picture of her son, Tyler. Just sitting on the ground, outside, for no good reason. God doesn't have to do that. But God says, I want to do it. I desire to be a help to those that are in need. God joys in giving grace. God relishes helping those who don't even know what they need. I don't even understand what I'm going through. I just need you. God says, just trust me. This is what I want to give you. Are you going to take it? Are you going to have the faith of a child and say, yeah, I'll take it. I'll take your grace, even though I don't even know what I'm going through. You see, if you allow him to, God will be the Alpha and Omega in your prayers. Amen. He'll be the Alpha. He'll be there in the beginning when, when you don't even know what you're asking for, when you don't even know how to ask for it. He'll be there right beside you, trying to coach you, trying to help you along, the Holy Spirit interpreting for you. And he is the Omega. He is the one that in the end will do the giving. Amen. When it's time for you to receive what God has deemed that you need, he is the one that gives it. You see, that's how good God is. Yeah. He is the beginning and the end in something that he has told us to do. He knows how weak we are. That's something he has told us to do. He says, here, I'll help you do that because I I know you're weak. As David said in Psalm 70, I am poor and needy. And God says, I know. I want to help you. I don't have to. (laughs) God doesn't have to. He wants to because he wants to show us his love. He wants to show us, I love you. And I want you to know that I care about you. I have no reason, no earthly, heavenly, whatever reason. I have no reason to not go to the Lord in prayer. I have no reason. There is no excuse. It's the most majestic throne, but it's a throne of grace where God has said, come boldly. But I I have no reason but to come with even greater boldness because it's a throne of grace. Because I now know I I may be a faulty sinner. I may be be, uh, the worst come, but God has told me to come, and he said it's a throne of grace. It's grace to help in time of need. So I come with boldness because he has told me to. He's the one that beckons me. It's not my deal. It's not my demandings. He is the one that has told me to come. He is the king, but he is the giver of grace. He is the almighty with the scepter of grace. (laughs) No excuse. There is none. There is no earthly reason, no heavenly reason, no humanly reason. Anyone could ever get to the place where I can't pray. It's a throne, and it's the throne of grace. (laughs) It's all-powerful, and it's forgiving. I want you to come. I want to help you. I want to show you my love. What else do we learn from the word grace? It is a throne of grace, where the one of infinite grace does sit. So it's a place where all my needs are supplied. The kings that sit on earthly thrones, you know, it's so funny because the kings of this earth and the rulers of this earth, that, you know, when you go visit them, it's to pay them homage. It's to bring them gifts. It's to bring them sacrifices. But when we go to our great heavenly king, he's the one. That's giving of gifts. He's the one that's showing his benevolence. When it should be us that are going to give him grace and give him gifts and give him sacrifices, he says, I'm the one. I am the gift giver. I am the arbiter of grace. See, this is the place 
at which he is the giver of good things. He is the one that will be giving the gifts and showing the love. It's just as Jesus Christ said when he was on this earth. He says, if you being evil, fathers, if you being evil of this flesh, know how to give good gifts to your kids, (laughs) then what do you think of God? He's the perfect one. He's the Holy One. And if you being evil and fleshly can give good gifts, just imagine what God, what the Holy One, the perfect one, will give to you. Just imagine he is the supplier of needs and he says, I want you to come. I want to show you my good things, the good thoughts I have towards you the tender thoughts that I think of you. I remember that passage in, I believe it was Chronicles, where God is telling that to the nation of Israel after they've gone astray and gone a-whoring after other gods and they're in captivity. And God says, but my thoughts are towards you. What is he saying? I still love you. No matter what you have done, I still love you. My grace is still for you. Come. Come quickly. Come, the poor and needy. God says, I I have everything you need. This is the throne of grace. That's why he says, come boldly. The poorest of the poor. The throne of grace is for you. You could not be more poor on this earth. God says, the throne of grace is for you. I want you to come. You see, what God is doing is he's taking away every excuse mankind can come up with no matter your excuse God's saying okay well here's the answer to that here's the answer to that see grace is the answer to all things because no matter who I am God says my grace is sufficient for thee faithful to the day you see those of no merit who have no hope they're destitute Grace is for you. It's the throne of grace. Come boldly. Those who have fallen deep in the mire of sin and transgression and have gone far from God, he says, come boldly. This is the place where I give grace. Come unto me, and I will give you grace. Remember, we come, and the Lord is the one that gives us gifts. He is the one that gives us grace. It's so backward in our minds that that's how God works. He doesn't work in the way that makes sense to us. He works in the way that he deems fit and that he deems necessary. And he says, I want to. I want to show you my love. I want to show you what you mean to me. You, my dear and beloved, I have created you. Think about that. God knows you and God created you. He knows the hairs on your head. How minuscule and unimportant of a fact. And God says, I know it. I know when one falls out, and I know it. How unimportant of a fact. But you see, when you love someone, the unimportant things become important. And the more you love someone, the more you're fascinated with everything about them. And God says, that's how important you are to me. That I know something you don't even know about yourself that you wouldn't even ever care to know about yourself. You wouldn't even care to know how many hairs are on your head. But God says, it's important to me. That's how precious you are to God. And in that same passage, that's when Jesus Christ says, and God knows when the sparrow falls. He knows it. And if God cares about the sparrow that much, how much does he care about you? It's the throne of grace. God says, I've made it just for you so you could come and receive the grace that you need, that I want to give you. I want to show you the things that I don't have to do. I want to show you the things that I get to do that I want to do, to show you the love that I don't need to show you, 
to go above and beyond that I don't need to. God never promised to do most of the things he promised to do. Sorry, God doesn't do, uh, God does much more than he ever promised to do. And he's promised a lot. But God always and constantly goes above and beyond (laughs) all that we ask or think. God says, ah, it's no big deal. It's the throne of grace. Come one, come all. It's the throne of grace. See, this is not the throne that's only accessible through great taxation. Oh, you can only come if you're the highest giver. Oh, you can only come if all of your debts are paid and that you have got all your ducks in a row. God says, no. Come one, come all. I desire for all to come. He says, I'm not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Come with my son, and I will not. I cannot reject you. It's the blank check of God. You come in the name of Jesus Christ. It's a blank check. God says, (laughs) whatever you want. My son's name is signed. Whatever you want. This throne is the opposite to mankind. This is the throne that finds glory, that finds greatness in a streaming fountain that never runs dry of goodness and mercy. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. See, God desires to show you how good and how great he is, and he relishes in that fact. He loves to love. He relishes He enjoys being the giver of gifts. He enjoys being the one that shows his love and his goodness and his mercy and his grace. And it's a never-ending fountain, the throne of grace. You come, as the psalmist says, my cup runneth over. God says, I want to in Malachi. He says, I want to pour you out. I want to open the windows of heaven. I want to pour you out a blessing which you cannot contain. I I want to do those things for you. I desire to do those things for you. You see, we come to the throne of grace and receive freely of all his goodness, of all his greatness. He says, come, I want to show you. Come boldly to the throne of grace. All needs are supplied. It's the throne of grace. There is nothing that grace cannot cover. There is nothing that grace cannot fulfill. There is nothing too far or too high or too low or too great for the grace of God. And he says, come boldly because it's for you. I have it for you. I know you. I know the hairs on your head and I want you to come before me. And I want to supply your needs. I want to give you and I want to show you if you just come, just let that sink in. All my needs supplied. God says, I want to show you my grace. Oh, the pathetic excuse of a Christian. I know. I fail you constantly. I know. It's still the throne of grace. You have still come boldly to the throne of grace. So receive my goodness. The fountains never run dry of the goodness of the Lord. And he says, you have come. And you have come to the throne of grace. You came to the right place. It never runs dry. My goodness and my grace. All needs are supplied. You see, the more it's turned In your thoughts, the sweeter and more delightful it becomes. Understand this. When I go to pray, I could spend lifetimes just cataloging my defects and my problems and every reason why I have no business standing before the throne of grace. But there is hope because it's the throne of grace. Despite my defects, it is the throne of grace. Prayer is a great and mighty act of the highest caliber. Come to the throne of grace 
God desires that you learn and grow. Amen. Oh, the more I look at myself, the more I see as the Apostle Paul, he began understanding. <laughs> oh, wretched man that I am. You see, I don't think it was Paul was some great wicked sinner. I think it was because Paul, the closer he grew to the Lord, the more he saw, wow, I am pathetic. I am vile. And I am allowed to come to the throne of grace. And it's freely bestowed on all who believe. And he desires to do it. Learn to pray. Christian, learn to pray. It's the throne of grace. It's the place to learn. It's the place to learn. God says, let me teach you. Let, let me help you. Just like with the child. Here, I know what you need. Here you go. It's the place where God says, let me teach you. Come to my grace and I'll give you. I will show you. Just trust me. Just come to me. God says, I'm taking all your excuses away. So you have nothing left but to say, I have nothing. There is no earthly reason, no humanly reason, no heavenly reason why I cannot pray. And God says, you're getting it now. I'm taking everything away. So it's just me and you. All of your excuses, all of your reasons, God says, I've taken them all away. So come boldly. That's why he says, let us therefore. He says, we have a high priest who sits on the right hand of God and he is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. God says, there's nothing that you can bring to God where God would say, ooh, I don't get that one. Hmm, that's a toughie. That never, that will never happen with God. Jesus Christ says in all points, he was tempted as we are and he did not sin. No matter what Jesus Christ went through, he came out on top. And that way, I know I can go to him. I can never say God doesn't understand. God understands more than I'll ever understand. And he takes our excuses away. And imagine God, I've given you this great gift of prayer. You get to come before me. The moment's notice, you stand before me and my grace. And well, all I want to do is just give. I want to show you my love. Right. Imagine God. He has taken all excuses away. And us in our pride and hubris find some baloney reason. I can't pray. Oh, no, I can't pray. God has taken all excuse away. And he's just waiting for the honest and humble man to say, I, I need you. I don't even know what I need, but I need you. You see, it's the throne of grace where all need to supply. You see, the Father will aid just as earthly fathers do with their children. He will aid, he will help, he will teach. Matthew seven eleven. if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more Shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? See, God's not in the business of holding back from his children. God's in the business of pour you out a blessing, which you cannot contain. But he's waiting for those that are willing to come boldly to his grace and say, I need you. I'm tired of going in what I understand and what I can do. I just need you. He's waiting for that childlike faith of, I just don't know. I need my father. Just as a child, a child's unafraid to go to their father when they're in need. I don't know what I need. They're crying. They're groaning. They don't know. But they know mom and dad will know. They know dad will know what to give me. That's why when children, when they feel sick, they want to be around mom and dad. Because that's where they feel safe. They feel like no matter what happens, I'll be with mom and dad, and they always can help. You see, God's trying to teach us a lesson. He's trying to say, yeah, and I'm the good one. I'm the good one. Are you going to trust me? 
I know what your unintelligible groanings are. I know what you need when you don't even know it. Just come to me. Come to my throne of grace. Could it be you have weak and little and feeble faith? <laughs> the graciousness of the Father. He honors the faith that is shown. You say, I don't know about that. That's what he did with Peter. What did he say? He said, oh, thou little faith. God says you don't have to have perfect faith. He says, I just need you to have faith. He says, without faith, it's impossible to please me. You see, God's the benevolent one. He's the one that says, here, let's try again. Here, let's try again. Oh, let's try again. Look at the life of Abraham. I mean, ooh, man. I, think of Sarah. I mean, Abraham was not a good husband. He didn't, listen to Abra- he didn't listen to Sarah when she was being good godly advice. He did listen to her when he shouldn't have, when she was not being good godly advice. And two times, two times, he valued his own life above hers. He says, no, you ain't going to tell them I'm your husband. They're going to kill me. And he allowed them to take his wife to live with them. So, that, so she could become their wives. And it's only by the grace of God. And it even says so. God even says Abimelech. He was the second one it happened to. He says, I know you're righteous. And that's why I have had you. So you did not know her. Meaning you did not do something you should not have done. <laughs> the goodness of God. Amen. And God still said with Abraham, let's try again. Hey, let's try again, Abraham. Let's try again. Years. This isn't like a couple months. This is years. Years. And then Abraham finally gets it. When he takes the knife and is about to plunge it into Isaac, God says, you got it. You finally trust in me. You see, that's the God of the million chances. He says, okay, (laughs) let's try again. You know, I wonder with Peter and Jesus when he walked on the water, I would assume they probably walked to the boat the rest of the way when Jesus Christ lifted him up. I don't think he just carried him. I mean, he might have. When Peter said, I go a fishing, I'm leaving it all behind. Jesus is dead. I'm going fishing. <laughs> and Jesus Christ comes and he has the conversation with him as Peter, lovest thou me? Oh, I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, lovest thou me? Oh, I love you. Feed my sheep. (laughs) Peter, lovest thou me? You see, in Hebrew, when you say something three times, it's a big deal. It, It means a lot when you say it three times. It's, a, it's an actual cultural thing where when you say it three times, it has a very deep meaning. And that's why Peter was greatly moved. And the last time he says, you know I love you. you the Bible even talks about it in the uh, last chapter of John. The goodness of the Lord. Jesus Christ said, let's try again, Peter. Yeah, you failed. You lied You cursed. You forsook me. You abandoned me. You rejected me. You went back to your old life. Let's try again. And I think Peter learned the lesson because when you read the book of 1 Peter, one of the things he says in the letter, he says, feed the flock of God. I think that's something that stuck with Peter for the rest of his life. 
You see, because Jesus Christ was saying, Peter, you, you, I'm, I'm going now. You're in charge. See, Jesus Christ, he was the first pastor of the church. And then he passed the baton on to Peter. That's what he was saying. Feed the sheep. Feed my sheep, Peter. I'm giving it to you. Imagine that. Peter's just the one that led all the disciples back to their old lives of fishing. And Jesus Christ says, you're the one, Peter. (laughs) Imagine how scumbag he felt. Not only in the past few days did he reject Christ, curse, lie about him, and forsake him. Not only did he cause all the disciples to go back to their old lives, Now Jesus Christ is telling him, and I want you back, and I want you to take over for me in leading and feeding the sheep. Once again, the Bible says that their eyes met when Jesus Christ was being beaten after the cock crowed the third time. Man, oh, (laughs) talk about devastation. I mean, just seriously, imagine that. Imagine being Peter, and Jesus Christ told you three times, you're going to deny me. I would never. (laughs) We often say such prideful things of a surety of our own Christianity. But you see, the love and the grace of God says, Peter, I know you're going to deny me. And I know you're going to forsake everything I taught you, but I still want you. And I want to use you in an even greater way. Imagine how much of a scumbag you feel like then. Just imagine the first time when you meet the eyes of Christ. You hear the rooster crow. He knew it right when he heard it. And he looks over And out of everything that's going on, Jesus Christ, staring right at him. I would do just what Peter did. Run away. There's nothing else he can do. But Jesus said, I still love you, Peter. Oh, I know you messed up. I know you did wrong. But this is the throne of grace. This is not the throne of law. You messed up, you die. No, this is the throne of grace. I want to give you another chance. Oh, you messed up again? I want to give you another chance. Despite my sinfulness, despite my shame and my filth, the arm of grace is always outstretched and grasping to help in our time of need. You see, grace is the great equalizer of our great downfalls. No matter my downfall, God says, I've got enough grace. Oh, I've got just enough grace for that. In fact, I'll have much more when you fall later, because I already know what you're going to do, but I got the grace for that too. That's the throne of grace. With these things true, my faults are overlooked, my desires are interpreted, and all my needs supplied. There's not a person alive that should not and would not be drawn to prayer. You have no other meaningful or logical reaction than to say, I need to pray. He's done all this, and he continues to do all this, and he offers all this. There's nothing more I can do than just to go pray. Amen. You have no excuse. It is on the throne on which grace does reside. Nothing repels you from the grace of God except for our own stubbornness. Yeah. Our own stubbornness is our own worst enemy. God says, my grace is for all. It's all sufficient. (laughs) 
I stand before the throne of grace. If prayer has become a commonplace thing to you, go back to the throne of grace and receive grace anew. God says, I want it to be fresh to you. (laughs) There is nothing but joy that could be felt when the fountain of grace overflows you. You see, now you can understand with boldness I go before the throne. Because no matter what else it may be, it's the throne of grace. We have no excuse for our pitiful prayer lives. It is the throne of grace. Be challenged and convicted and changed by the power of grace that gushes forth from the throne of the Almighty. How's your prayer life? Does it live up to the throne of grace? God says, it's grace. Bring it all to me. I've given you all the grace you need. What is God saying? Don't hold anything back. Just bring it all to me. How's your prayer life? I know mine needs a lot of work. How about you? See, once again, it's one thing just to say, oh, it needs work. Okay, let's work on it. Don't be satisfied with mediocrity. Challenge to strive for excellence. It's the throne of grace. What more can God do? What more can he do? He says, come boldly. And we come begrudgingly. He says, I have grace. What more can God do? He's waiting. So why don't we come? Let's pray. Dear Father.